It's 7 o'clock. Welcome to a Sky News Tonight special on Afghanistan. After 20 years of foreign occupation, the country fell to the Taliban on the 15th of August last year. Now a country under international sanctions and the strict regime of the Taliban, millions of people are going without food and medicine. In a series of special reports from Afghanistan, Sky News has witnessed firsthand the suffering people are facing under the new rule. Suffering that has prompted the United Nations to ask for more than $5 billion in funding. That is the largest ever appeal for a single country for humanitarian assistance. This is a Sky News Tonight special. Afghanistan, the fight for survival. In fact, it appears a... I think it's a procession of, uh, of the Taliban. This is absolutely awful. Before the explosion, we just decided to go back home because we couldn't make way to go inside the airport. A dark future looking for us. We are lost our jobs. We are lost our dreams. The suffering on the ground is absolutely palpable. The international community cannot condemn the Afghan people to collective punishment and starvation because they failed in their mission. This man tells us we've no choice. We've already sold our kidneys. Now we've got to sell our children. We are nervous about for our security, our family. We want to uh, live in safe uh, situation in our country, but this is not uh, possible. A very good evening. In tonight's special, we'll be getting the thoughts of our experts about the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, as well as getting their response to a series of reports delivered by our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, who joins me now live from the capital, Kabul. And uh, Alex, of course, you've been witnessing and describing for us some, some truly desperate scenes. Uh, give us your impression of how it is on the ground. Well, it actually is pretty horrendous. There are images that no one should have to witness and definitely no one should have to live through. Uh, images that we can't even bring to you because it's before the watershed of, of babies who've frozen to death. And they're not isolated cases. They very much are not isolated cases. On one morning, there was a mother who'd, who'd lost two of her babies, frozen, wandering around Kabul market, holding them and crying. This is a, a very regular, regular event. There are literally millions, millions of people who are going to bed hungry tonight, who don't have enough food and who are resorting to ever more desperate measures just to survive. We saw literally scores and scores of men who'd sold body parts. Now, the kidney organ trade is quite a lucrative one. It always has been for many years, especially near the Iranian border. But the figures that we're seeing on the ground, the anecdotal evidence that we're getting is that it has spiked enormously over the past six months. So now it's not just men who are selling their body parts, it's women too. And I was particularly shocked by that because these women were so young. They were 17 years old, 18, 19, 20. They'd already sold their kidneys. They didn't have anything else to sell. The next thing that was in line was one of, one of their children. Um, they'd often lost babies and toddlers already through starvation or through illness brought on by being malnourished. And now they were thinking the, the very worst as far as the mother's concerned, trying to sell off a child to try and keep the others alive. And many families, many, many families say that was the only option, that if they're going to keep the others alive, they've got to do this. There is people begging everywhere you go. You know, if you're in a car, if you're in a street, if you're walking, almost every single town, village that we went to, people saw us as foreigners and immediately came up and there's, there's children, tiny children begging. There's women in burqas offering, sitting on the streets offering to sell their children. There are babies in Burns units in Herat who um, are being sent home, prospect of being sent home to die because their parents and the hospital cannot afford to pay for the bandages to keep them alive. So a very desperate situation here on the ground, Dermot. And, Alex, what are the Taliban? They, of course, say they've changed from the last time they ruled Afghanistan, that they're allowing humanitarian aid through, they're, they're not hunting members of the regime, that they're 
promoting women and allowing them to access education. Is that the reality? I think we have to take everything that they say with a huge pinch of, pinch of salt, and I say that from direct evidence. We have, we have spoken to a number of female activists and their families, their relatives who have been raided, who protested about the drawing back of women's rights and who were then, their homes were raided and they were actually arrested, and they have disappeared. When I put it to senior Taliban spokesmen, they flatly denied it, absolutely flatly denied it, even though we have multiple eyewitnesses uh, neighbours who can speak at length about seeing Taliban fighters coming to the house, raiding and picking them up. Uh, aid on the ground, even if there is some aid, it is not nearly enough. Now, the Taliban are running on empty. They have no money. Many of them are under international sanctions. There is no money here. It is a completely empty cash economy, which means that the Taliban, for instance, are starting a, 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 wor a work for aid program. So they will give you aid if you come to work. They're paying state employees because that food aid, which the country depended on so much nearly six months ago, has just disappeared. That means civil servants, health workers, nurses, teachers, engineers are all not being paid. So the country is definitely, definitely suffering. Have the Taliban changed? I would say absolutely categorically they have not changed enough for certain because the women's rights have been eroded, human rights have been eroded, people are being hunted down because they worked for former, the former government, because they worked with the former uh, foreign troops who were based here. And this is all despite promises from the Taliban who promised that there would be an amnesty and there would be um, equal rights for women. Alex, for the time being, thanks for that. We'll speak uh, a lot more. A bit later on in this special, and uh, just to let you know earlier today, we put some of those issues to the Taliban's official spokesperson and the United Nations humanitarian coordinator in Kabul, and we'll bring you those interviews throughout this special. Uh, but first, uh, I want to get to the initial thoughts of our esteemed panel. I'm joined now by Sir Mark Lowcock, who's the former UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. We've got Shukriya Araksai, who's a former Afghan politician and ambassador to Norway, who escaped from Afghanistan to the United Kingdom. And Rory Stewart joins us, formerly Secretary of State for International Development. A very good evening to you all. If I could start with you, Sir Mark, I mean, quite clearly, Afghanistan is facing the abyss. How did we get to this point? Yeah, it is facing the abyss, below which is mass starvation of the whole population. And that's arisen because starting from a very fragile position six months ago, um, the effect of the collapse of the economy produced largely by decisions taken by Western countries when the Taliban came under control, has been to rob people of their incomes. It's been to rob the country of the ability to import food. So people are starving and desperate, and that is why they are selling their kidneys and their other body parts, and that is why they're selling their children. So you can trace back to the immediate aftermath of the Taliban takeover, the, the direct causes of the abyss we're seeing now, and indeed, Many people, including people you have on the program tonight, forecast that unless different things happened, we would be seeing this kind of situation now. And Rory Stewart, your your thoughts uh, on just that that history, recent history, the the twenty years of uh, Western rule, Western occupation, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars spent. It just wasn't meant to be like this. It's, it's heartbreaking. I think it's heartbreaking in every way. It's heartbreaking because, in effect, we, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the NATO allies caused this. We built a huge Afghan state, and we made an Afghan budget with 70% dependence on international aid, so that teachers couldn't be paid without international aid, health work couldn't keep going without international aid, supported the entire economy, and then we turned around on a dime, left in August, abandoned the country completely, have now frozen the bank accounts, cut off all the support to those teachers' salaries. And I feel that although the politicians are often saying the reason they're not providing the aid more flexibly is they're worried the Taliban are going to steal it, there isn't really any evidence for that at all. There's not evidence the Taliban is stealing aid. The real reason we're not providing it is that the West feels humiliated and bitter because it was defeated. Shakira Baraksai, just give us your sense of the, quite clearly, the 
the missed opportunities, the legions of missed opportunities over the past two decades or so? There was a lot of opportunities that have been missed, but unfortunately today's situation is not the fault of Afghans. First of all, we should be clear about this one. And of course, the starvation of a nation shouldn't be a type of punishment that the international community, in, including the Taliban, would like to see in it. I think this is the catastrophe, this is the humanitarian crisis, which is immediate need to be assistance. And I hope the United Nations should reach out as soon as possible to put in dot for that catastrophe at the moment. Otherwise, this humanitarian crisis will may deliver a lot of bad impact, not only the security in the world, but of course, probably in the 21st century, the most horrific humanitarian crisis in the history. Well, do stay with us, because that is the very issue we are going to address right now head on. Because when Kabul fell to the Taliban, the UN promised not to leave the people of Afghanistan behind. That's from the UN Secretary General. Well, a bit earlier, I put just that to Dr. Ramiz Alakbarov, the humanitarian coordinator at the United Nations with special responsibility for Afghanistan, based in the capital, Kabul. We did what we said we will do. We stayed and we delivered. It's uh, been a very, very difficult several months. Uh, we've been working in getting aid to the country. Uh, we managed towards the end of the year to scale up uh, to almost 18 million people with food, uh, and uh, more than 8 million people were uh, reached just since the August. And uh, I'm very proud of what my teams here in Afghanistan and all of us as the UN were able to do. And you need continuing support. You need more. The, the estimate coming from the UN is immediately $4.5 billion. Absolutely. This is a huge humanitarian catastrophe. You have half of the country uh, in acute uh, need of food, uh, medicines, and essential supplies. Uh, we also need to support and maintain uh, basic human needs of this country, and that means access to essential social services such as health, uh, supply of water, electricity, and obviously, uh, as, as we're crossing a very harsh winter month, all of it is absolutely critical for survival of the people. When it comes to the distribution of this much-needed aid on such a large scale, tell me about the UN's cooperation or lack of it with the Taliban, because, you know, the Taliban have recently asked for a greater role. They want to work alongside the UN coordinating aid. Is that possible? Would that make it more efficient? So, uh, Taliban, just as any other recipient of the humanitarian aids, uh, uh, like de facto authorities in the areas where there are recipients of the humanitarian aids, I mean, uh, they can uh, highlight to us that, uh, okay, there are certain areas that are the vulnerable people, and insofar we would like to assess uh, these areas independently. But uh, they do not participate in aid distribution. We do not provide any aid into the hands of Taliban, and they are not present at the places and the times when they, they do it. What happens if the world doesn't get its act together, if that four and a half billion and more isn't found and distributed? Just give us your, your eyewitness sense of just how bad things are. It is bad. Imagine you're traveling through the rural areas and you're going to hospitals where you see five, six children on one bed, freezing on the bed because there is no, uh, there is no heating and you're looking at their eyes and there's no sufficient amount of medicine or anything to treat them. And between the freezing temperature and, and, and the measles, uh, which is hitting them hard, malnourished children, the outcomes don't look good. Out of 10 women which are in need of cesarean section today in Afghanistan, only three will be able to get it. What that means for seven women who will not get cesarean section, uh, I, I don't think I need to explain what that means. The, the, the human face of it, what is staring at us, is extremely poor, rural, underdeveloped Afghanistan with thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people not able to have a basic, very basic meal and very basic human dignity setting with some, some, some warmth and, and, and some protection. 
Dr. Ramiz Alakbarov uh, from the UN in Kabul. Well, throughout this special program, uh, we'll be bringing you some of the reports that Alex Crawford and her team have delivered from Afghanistan in the past few weeks. The first clip we can show the desperate situation of people living in a village near Harat, where people, as Alex alluded to, are selling their kidneys to pay for food and fighting over aid. The aid is fought over. What's here is far outweighed by the huge need. It's really very hard in Afghanistan right now, she says, and there are too many people like me who don't have a husband or a father to support them. For women who aren't allowed to work under the Taliban and aren't even allowed to complain about that, it's misery on misery. She's crying, telling us her bag of flour has been stolen. I don't know what I'm going to do, she says. Foreign aid's not feeding into the country, whilst politicians wrestle over dealing with the Taliban regime, holding power because they're holding the guns. Well, let's get back to the thoughts of our panel about uh, the aid situation. And Shukri Baraksai, as you said earlier, it's not the Afghan people who are responsible for this dire situation. Let me ask you then about the Taliban. Are they the problem or, or perhaps even part of the solution? There's no doubt to, to seeing Taliban as a problem because the lack of responsibility from the Taliban side and the lack of experience as a ruling government or government is also one of the issues. Taliban are just a militant group, but uh, they can change this de facto government, can change their face from the problem to be a part of solution if they are willing to cooperate with international organization, if they trying to gain uh, a local uh, legitimacy or internal legitimacy inside of Afghanistan, or if they are accepting the very basic fundamental um, human rights and, uh, and civil rights in Afghanistan, if they're going to change their uh, or fulfill their promises that they made in Doha, I think that will change the, the, the Taliban from a problem to be a solution. But to be honest, what is very, very important, um, in the last six months, everybody has been aware that the humanitarian crisis is on the way. When United Nations appealed for foreign aid, I think before December, well, more than $1 billion was been collected. The question is, why the aid is not reaching out immediately and necessary to the people. I believe politicizing aid, either by donors or Taliban, that's not the, that's not the solution that we should think about it. You know, for, for the humanitarian aid, we should be very fast, very quick and very sufficient to deliver rather than putting conditions from both parties. And that, those conditions will may not be solved. That's why a part of those humanitarian aids that need to be delivered, it was been hanging in the middle. And that's why people are starving now. I think okay. before we understood, we everybody was learned and aware that um, the crisis was on the way. It's not just only humanitarian crisis, it's a political crisis, economical crisis, yep. and all other crises, including the lack of human dignity, which is Taliban, are not really willing to accept it as being okay. part of the crisis. But who's trying to solve the crisis mm -hmm. without well, thinking? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I just want to get the, the, the thoughts of the gentleman in the, in the discussion, because they're, they're nodding along um, with that analysis. And uh, Rory Stewart, and I mean, basically, is the situation just so dire that talking about the, the fineries of um, the political settlement and... Uh, who does this, that and the other, doesn't really matter at this point. It's getting this much needed aid to the people that need it before they die. Absolutely. Look, political settlement with the Taliban is very important, but it's a long-term, painful, patient business. And there are 9 million people on the edge of starvation. It is unbelievable that we're not doing more to help. The U United States alone was spending $100 billion a year in Afghanistan at the peak of its presence there. We're asking for only 5% of that money. 
And the security actually at the moment in Afghanistan is better than it has been, paradoxically, for nearly 15 years. There is absolutely no reason why we could not have development workers on the ground. And the reason this money isn't being collected and the reason it isn't being spent is that the governments are not putting their energy behind it. People are tied up in bureaucratic regulations, there are incredible numbers of restrictions which are making NGOs very nervous about the work they do on the ground. Not nervous the Taliban, but nervous that they're gonna get in trouble from UN sanctions or get in trouble from US Treasury rules. And it is extraordinary, at the very moment where assistance needs to be coming, many of these governments are actually cutting the support to NGOs that have been operating on the ground for 15 or 20 years. Well, let's just, um, I'm gonna bring in Sir Mark Lowcock on that, but let's just uh, take our viewers through just the scale of some of the relief that's needed, what aid is required in Afghanistan. The United Nations, as you may have heard already, says $4.4 billion are needed immediately for the Afghanistan humanitarian response plan alone to pay direct, as Rory Stewart was saying there, to health workers and others, not the de facto authorities. With an extra $623 million to support refugees and host communities in five neighbouring countries for the Afghanistan Situation Regional Refugee Response Plan. Now, the UK has pledged just under £100 million of emergency aid for vital humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan this winter. £286 million to be committed in total this financial year. Uh, and, Sir Mark, uh, eye-watering amounts and needed as, as soon as possible, as we've been, been saying. Just talk us through, though, the role of sanctions in making this situation worse. Yes, the sanctions is what's collapsed the economy, basically, and the sanctions include the slashing of the aid. Um, the, it's really not rocket science to turn this problem round quickly. All that's needed is people who promised the money, including the British government, to write the checks quickly. That will enable the UN to scale up. And then Afghanistan's own resources, money held by individuals, which is blocked in foreign accounts, money owed to Afghanistan by the World Bank, Afghanistan's foreign exchange reserves, those things need to be unlocked as well alongside the um, funding of the UN appeal. Um, all of those things have been done in other circumstances, in other countries. So nobody can pretend they don't know what's needed. No one can pretend they don't know what the source of the problem is. I think uh, what's needed is uh, a uh, recognition that the country's now on the abyss. If you don't act now, you are going to be staring in the face of mass starvation, and that will be on the shoulders of decision makers who have all the information on what needs to be done. Well, much more to come. Thank you for the time being for that, because uh, I want to take uh, you through now some of the response from the Taliban, because earlier today I spoke to Sahail Shaheen. He's the Taliban's official spokesperson. And I asked him directly about the humanitarian crisis in his country and if the Taliban was responsible. It is the result of the sanction imposed on Afghanistan. So it uh, returns to those who have imposed the sanctions which have resulted in a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. On our behalf, during the last six months, we have done what we have we had in our uh, capacity uh, to do for, for the people of Afghanistan, uh, and uh, we will continue to do so in order to alleviate the suffering, the problems of the people of Afghanistan. But it needs uh, the international community uh, to cooperate with us, uh, not to punish the people of Afghanistan by imposing uh, unjustified uh, sanctions in the country. But to have those sanctions relieved, to gain that recognition you say you want, the international community uh, requires you to do some pretty simple things that you've said you will do, but you haven't done yet. Um, guarantee the rights of women, of minorities, open up education to all, uh, so many simple things. Why haven't they happened yet? Those things has happened because it is the demand of the people of Afghanistan. We have no problem 
with women having access to work and to education. A few days ago, our Minister of Higher Education announced opening of all universities uh, to both male and female students. So that issue is resolved. Only in some places, there may be the issue of capacity, like not having uh, enough number of, uh, of uh, lecturers and professors, and like uh, not uh, having uh, uh, money uh, to uh, carry out our uh, programs. It is uh, the obligation of uh, the international community uh, to uh, provide us, uh, uh, cooperate us uh, financially uh, in order to uh, achieve that uh, goal. Well, that's the uh, Taliban's interpretation. We'll get more from my interview with Sahel Shaheen uh, a bit later in this special programme. But first, let's see uh, more of what our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, has witnessed during her time in the country. How some families in Bargis province are selling their young daughters into marriage to raise money. Five years old. Seven years. Nine years. Six years old. These are girls already sold into marriage, many too young to even know their own ages. Eight years. They're often prompted by their guardians. Six years. The husbands they'll go to are a decade or more older. The last to talk is five years old. The youngest, in her father's arms, is a seven-month-old baby given in lieu of medical bills. The girls have no say. This in one of Afghanistan's poorest villages. And the deprivation here means girls are being sold into marriage earlier and more often. There's not enough room in the tent for all the parents who want to show us their young daughters they've sold. We don't want to sell them, she says, but we're poor and we have to eat. Yes, but uh, well, let's return to our panel now. And uh, Shukri Barakzai, it is crucial in terms of how we deal with the Taliban, how they treat women and young girls. Of course. I think just the interview and the report of Alex can give a proper picture what's going on in Afghanistan. Denying from Taliban side, it's not something new. They've always been keeping denying. They're taking hostage women. They denied. They are uh, shooting on a woman on the streets, particularly the protester. They denied. They didn't accept. They didn't take responsibility. Even when it comes to the poverty or delivering services, they are not taking responsibility. But when it comes to the women, um, when I when I saw that video, it's it's really it's it's very heartbroken because I was been working for twenty four years and I've been standing against the child marriages, forced marriages, and 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 that's I think something which is it's not only. Afghan, and I think this is the international community should take action. This is not the time that we should be just witnessing what's going on and showing sympathy. It's need more further steps. We need to hold Taliban accountable for the situation and circumstances that today the people of Afghanistan are facing. It's not the, the fault of Afghan people, it's the fault of us. Even most of the time I'm blaming myself because I rely on those partners, which is they betray us. So this is the time we should put, again, our effort together to at least gain back one thing with the name of humanity. When it comes to the Taliban and their rules, of course, they've never been kind with the women and they their policy always been so harsh before. So Shahin says that they offered and they announced opening of the university. But today in the social media, they didn't let women to get into those universities yeah. because they asked them to full cover their face from head to toes. And this is something, even not Islamic action, as the Taliban are measuring today, and they are forcing on the women in Afghanistan. I think the women's issue with the Taliban is a historical issue between women and Taliban, yeah. and we will not give up. It's, it's time the Taliban should fix their own problems rather than women in Afghanistan. Rory Stewart, share with us your 
insight into the nature of the Taliban. Clearly, there's a centre in, you know, Sahel Shaheen uh, saying those things, and maybe he, he believes them ultimately. And, you know, the United States negotiates with that centre. We see it ourselves. But just the nature of Afghanistan and the, the nature of the Taliban and its representatives, its members spread out over such a, a vast area, over so many provinces, is it possible to understand it as a single entity? Of course, it's very fragmented and it's very thin. It's not really a governing apparatus. This was a resistance movement that fought for 20 years to try to destroy almost everything that the Afghan government, backed by the international community, tried to create. And these are people driven by a very, very strange religious vision, which is not really an Islamic vision. It's a very peculiar Taliban vision, which comes from communities in southern Afghanistan. And they are, of course, all those things that Shukri Barakzai has said. They have very repressive views towards women. They are very fragmented. There are at least three major groups in the Taliban. They have very complicated relationships with terrorist groups, and they've actually pulled some very major terrorist figures into their government. But, and this is a very difficult thing to say, we cannot use that as an excuse to starve the Afghan people. There is no point going on television and attacking the Taliban for their imposing restrictions on women going to school. Women can go to school in Afghanistan, but in restricted ways. But we cannot complain about that if we are refusing to provide any of the money that pays teachers' salaries. Not a single teacher has been paid in Afghanistan since August. So, Mark, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts then on how we, how we nuance that, how you keep the pressure on the Taliban. But as Rory Stewart, as you've all been saying, how that money flows as quickly as possible to these desperate people. Well, the UN for the last 20 years, with NGOs and others, has been providing assistance to deal with humanitarian problems month after month, year after year, with the acquiescence and tolerance of the Taliban in areas they've controlled. As Ramiz Alparov said earlier in your programme, agencies know how to do this. The Taliban have got used to not interfering with the distribution of food and other assistance. That the central immediate problem right now is, is because of the economic measures and the sanctions, the agencies don't have the money to reach all the people who are starving. I think there's need for some kind of international conference now at the leader level uh, to really get a grip of this because time is running out to deal with this problem. Some things can be dealt with in the medium term, like some kind of new policy or engagement with the Taliban, which every country in the world is going to need to work out a solution for. But the immediate problem is to avoid, you know, the moral repugnant outcome of a population being starved as a result of the economic measures, because people don't like a regime that the population itself had no choice over. Well, do stay with us. We're going to take a break. But just before we do that, um, let's uh, leave you with uh, some more stark figures. All of them are stark, aren't they? Uh, because uh, this is the the scale of the problem there, out of a population of, of just over 30 million people in Afghanistan. According to the World Food Programme, over two-thirds, 22.8 million people are facing severe hunger there. Nearly 9 million, 8.7, are on the brink, the very brink of starvation itself, and 10 million children are in need of humanitarian aid. That's uh, figures uh, that UNICEF have released. Uh, much more to discuss then on that. You're watching... A special Sky News Tonight programme, Afghanistan, the fight for survival.
Welcome back to our special program, Afghanistan, the fight for survival. Well, there have been many reports from the country of people who were against the Taliban who, or who have helped foreign forces going missing or being hunted by the Taliban regime. And Sky's Alex Crawford visited a jail which suggests that the Taliban has been carrying out a vendetta against employees of the country's former government. Many have been here for months already and they're accused of stealing, adultery, not paying debts and fraud. The prison governor is behind us, so they answer our questions cautiously. But one with a fresh injury tells us many are employees of the former government. He says they've been put here without proof or trials. The governor tells our interpreter not to translate before we're moved on. So we're being told not to ask them any more questions and uh, to leave. The Taliban promised an amnesty for those who worked with the foreign troops or the government they toppled. But our evidence suggests this is not being applied. Instead, there are widespread claims that those now behind bars are only there because of multiple vendettas being carried out instead. The governor used to run a secret Taliban prison before they came to power. His office may be different, but human rights groups are worried he's using the same old techniques. He and his men are implicated in the disappearance of the female governor of the women's prison. Alia Azizi disappeared more than four months ago, and she's not been seen since. And the governor admits to us he personally rang her to come to work. He says he's no idea where she is, but insists she was corrupt, and she's probably claimed asylum elsewhere. Let's bring our panel back in, Sir Mark Lowcock, uh, former UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. We've got uh, Shukriya Baraksai, who's a former Afghan politician and ambassador to Norway, who escaped from Afghanistan to the UK, and Rory Stewart, the former Secretary of State for International Developments. Well, let's get on to that very subject, uh, Sir Mark. And, uh, the people there that Alex was reporting on, Alex Crawford was reporting on, are some of the people to whom the West owe a duty of care, a duty of protection to, and that's down to this botched withdrawal. How did we get it so badly wrong? Well, I'm sure that historians will study that for a long time and the lessons need to be learned from it. I think that the... You know, it's highly credible, actually, the messages that Alex was conveying in that last report there. The Taliban is fragmented, as Rory Stewart said earlier. There's not a very good command and control system. It may well be that some things are happening that the leadership might not want to be happening, but there's a history of very bad things happening. The issue really is, is that justification for the mass starvation of the whole population? And clearly it's not. So we need to separate out the needs of the total population from the need to engage with the Taliban to try to get them over the medium and longer term to behave in a more acceptable way. Shukriya Baraksai, as a, as a former member of the, uh, the previous administration, would that be happening to you, do you think, if you'd remained? Well, lots of things happened to me, but um, it's, it's hard to remain there because um, when... You, you, before you give some figures, let me let me tell you one thing. I think the most important thing Afghanistan needs, 35 million people needs justice, the rights of freedom and dignity. I think in the absence of these three, it's hard to, to take care of starvation or humanitarian crisis, or even to talk about those people, which is they work with foreigners as an interpreter or as others, because the lack of justice is... Uh, been badly damaging the Afghan people and population and their different name and the different circumstances. So because we we are, it's not only women are being a victim of uh, Taliban policies. It's also people that they work with foreign troops. It's it's also not a very nice to see your ex colleagues was been left behind just because of bureaucracy. They couldn't reach and they couldn't get to safe places. And this is, uh, for the Taliban, that's more than enough to punish and shoot someone because they work with foreign uh, troops or they work with the um, uh, former government of Afghanistan. And I think that's such a kind of behavior 
it's uh, it's it's a very um, an, another another top. Even you cannot imagine how difficult it is to to deal with the Taliban and and to accept them under one roof. But what is the most important one? So, uh, of course, to taking care and tackling this starvation. But besides of everything, freeing and releasing the people, 35 million with a dignity and uh, with a humanity, with with a, with a freedom. That's that's also very very important. Which is no one trying uh, to even mm. think about it. I feel bad when mm. today the Sir David Richard was asking uh, for a kind yeah. of negotiation and legitimacy for the Taliban. Okay. Nobody asked him. Okay, Sir. Why you fight against them when you were leading the uh, coalition force in Afghanistan? If they were such a dear today, okay. why yesterday you have to I, fight I, with them? I just want to get on to Rory Stewart there and this issue of the duty of care. And, you know, there's awful scenes we saw uh, back in August of people clinging to aircraft being blown up outside the airport. Just, just terrible scenes. And that duty of care... You know, let's just concentrate on the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom said at the time, those of you who can't get out, make your way to a third country and we will facilitate you coming to the UK. Is there any evidence of that actually happening? No, it's a terrible betrayal. The UK government made some big announcements in August, committed to take 25,000 Afghans, said it was going to focus on Afghans who are particularly the kind of people who are vulnerable to the sort of images you were showing. In other words female judges, for example, who prosecuted the Taliban or human rights campaigners. But in fact, the scheme hasn't really come into existence at all. And it's very, very difficult for Afghans to cross into neighboring countries and register with UNHCR, which is what the British government said they needed to do. And the British government is part of a complete failure, which I'm afraid extends to most of our European neighbors and allies too, to actually take serious numbers of Afghans as refugees from that country. We could do it very easily. There are lots of human rights organizations, NGOs on the ground that could help to process Afghans who are genuinely at need, who are genuinely, if they stay there much longer, are gonna find themselves at risk of being killed. There is a window for them to get out. There's a window for many of these people to be able to get out and we are not providing it. Yet again, we are betraying Afghans and it's extraordinary. For 20 years, the international community kept saying, that we were committed to Afghanistan, that Afghanistan was vital to our security, that we were going to invest all these lives and money. And then in an instant, in the middle of August, we decided to forget all about it and all those responsibilities. OK, I uh, want to get uh, the Taliban response now uh, from Suhail Shaheen, the official spokesperson for the Taliban, who spoke to me earlier. And I asked him about uh, this issue of uh, activists disappearing. Sky News has been reporting on an increasing number of young female activists disappearing, being kidnapped, with eyewitnesses saying that this is being done by the Taliban. No, they, these are allegations. I have heard these allegations. But when I contacted the intelligence department and the Ministry of Interior, uh, they told me that no one from uh, their departments has uh, detained any ac activists. So in Afghanistan, there are people in order to make uh, uh, cases of uh, asylum and to resettle abroad, they are making such uh, fake uh, cases. So Hail Shaheen there. Now you're watching uh, Sky News Tonight's special program about Afghanistan, the fight for survival. Stay with us. I'm Stuart Ramsey, and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end, and they're really, really desperate. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them into trucks. You either live and recover, or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. 
They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, they were right. An enormous explosion has just come down. I think it was a monster that's just landed in between us. The information on this could bring down the entire network, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but if we're drawn, it's so, so hot. Welcome back to this special program, Afghanistan, the fight for survival. Well, winters in Afghanistan can, of course, be tough at the best of times. But this year, there's also a measles outbreak and a shortage of medicines, which really does mean it's a struggle for the weakest to stay alive. Here's more of Alex Crawford's reporting from Badgis. The women of Badgis queue for hours for free paracetamol for the sick. In Afghanistan's most deprived province, Nothing comes easy and everything's scarce. They're cramming babies onto beds in the province's main hospital. In some wards, it's standing room only. A measles outbreak is ripping through them. In the tiny, who have already poor immunity, measles can be a death sentence. Let's get back to our panel on that. Uh, and uh, Rory Stewart, here's another illustration, if we needed one, of the scale and range of this crisis, and is it reaching the point where, let me read you uh, the words of General Dave Richards, uh, former chief of the defence staff, uh, of course, saying, we're going to end up recognising the Taliban government, so I'd better do it sooner rather than later to begin alleviating situations like that, which, of course, can, can spread and have spread beyond Afghanistan's borders already. I think we need to separate off the leverage and the influence we want to have on the Taliban in the future, which may mean holding back some diplomatic recognition, holding back big investment projects for the future. But we need to provide immediately, generously, quickly, humanitarian and development support to stop people from starving. And to do that, we need to engage with the Taliban. Now, that may not be the same as full diplomatic recognition, but that definitely means that we need to have the confidence to provide the money to get the healthcare system going again, get those teachers' salaries paid, get development programs going. The truth of the matter is the Afghan people did not choose the Taliban. There's no evidence that the Taliban is stealing aid money, and we shouldn't be sacrificing millions of Afghan lives in some ludicrous idea that by doing so, we're going to change the Taliban's behaviour. Shakriya Baraksai, so Mark, briefly, if you both would, that very question. Time to recognise the Taliban. Shakriya Baraksai. Not at all. I do believe this is the time to concentrate and focus more about delivering very sufficiently humanitarian aid. And plus, there in Afghanistan, inside of Afghanistan, there's a huge potential of non-governmental organization. They work in the entire 20 years. They are operating much better than Taliban de facto government. We should invest on them and we should ask for them. And of course, we should also give a chance for women to be employees on those non-governmental organization. And that will maybe be a part of solution. So, Mark, we're going to do it sooner or later. Why not do it now, this recognition? The immediate issue isn't recognition of the Taliban. It's not going to happen. Even if it did, it wouldn't feed a starving child. The immediate issue is to avoid a massive humanitarian tragedy involving the loss of millions of lives and all of the other destabilisation that will go with it, the supercharging of the opium and heroin economy, a big exodus of people who will flood across the borders, already 5,000 a day going across into Iran, and the empowering and giving succor 
to extremist groups like the Islamic State franchise, who are even more brutal and unacceptable than the Taliban. So the, the, the international community needs to seize their responsibilities, and they need to do it now. Well, listen, thank you all so much for your erudite and insightful thoughts. Mark Lowcock, Shukriya Baraksai and Rory Stewart. Very good talking to you all. Thank you so much for joining us on this special programme. And uh, throughout it, we have, of course, been talking about the issues about what the future looks like for Afghanistan. Well, I put that to Sahel Shaheen, the Taliban's official spokesman. And what happens if the Taliban leadership do what the international community requires and continues to develop a, an inclusive, a, a diverse leadership? There are those within the Taliban movement who don't, we know that, you know that, who don't want to see that happen. They want the Taliban to, to rule as they did in the last century, in the 1990s and early 2000s. Could the Taliban fall apart, turn in on itself, be subject, as it is already, to attacks from Islamic State groups? First of all, I want to, uh, to assure you and all that we are committed uh, to Doha agreement. And based on that agreement, uh, we are uh, not allowing anyone, any entity group, uh, to use the soil of Afghanistan against other countries. It is our policy and commitment. Uh, we do not have any foreign agenda. Uh, what uh, we have uh, is uh, to focus on uh, the reconstruction uh, of Afghanistan. And for that, we want to have cooperation with other countries. We pay the way and facilitate investment of other countries in Afghanistan in our huge natural uh, resources to come here, because that uh, will be beneficial for all sides and also will uh, create jobs for the people of Afghanistan, will also uh, help contribute to security uh, in the country. And security stability in Afghanistan means security stability uh, in uh, the Niger, uh, in the region and the world. Sahel Shaheen, uh, the Taliban's uh, official spokesman. Well, let's go back to our special correspondent, uh, Alex Crawford, live for us in Kabul. And uh, Alex, listening to what we've heard in this hour, things are clearly moving, in part due to reporting such as your own, but are they moving fast enough? I definitely think they're definitely not moving fast enough. We're seeing people, children, families, men, women, health workers, teachers, suffering, dying every day, all day now here on the ground in Afghanistan. And the country... Is, has got an economy that is not functioning. They're not doing trade with anyone around the world. They're not doing... There's no political discourse between anyone around the world. So the people on the ground are very, very much being hit. And there isn't time for them. They're already suffering. They don't think there's an impending humanitarian disaster. It is actually here right now, and they're going through it. Some of them are dying quickly. Others are dying a much more slow starvation death. But the, the end result at the moment is that something has got to give. And if it doesn't give, there's going to be many, many more people dying and suffering. So even a sliver of optimism, Alex? I don't think so right now. There is very much no optimism right now. There has to be some giving. And the Taliban, the senior Taliban spokesman that I spoke to, has said very much that they are here to stay. They're not going anywhere. So they've offered out a hand of friendship. They want another one back. And somehow they've got to meet in the middle to stop thousands of people dying. Alex, thank you so much. And thank you for your remarkable reporting. Alex Crawford there, live for us in Kabul. Uh, thanks to her and the team and Afghanistan and to our panel, Samar Bokok, Shukriya Baraksai and Rory Stewart, and to you for watching.